Hello, everyone. Welcome back to this week's Algebraic Graph Theory Seminar. This week, we have Sam Matthews to tell us about our Earth's cradle result for the flags in the sphere buildings. Thank you, indeed. So I will be talking about uh, some, some work of mine that appeared uh, on archive a while back with uh, Jan Le Bull and Klaus Metsch. So I've tried to keep this talk um, as like a high tutorial value, so it's uh, comprehensible to a broad audience, but I saw there's quite a few participants who are really well familiar with uh, a lot of these topics, so I apologize in advance if half of the talk is uh, boring. <laughs> to put it that way for you. So I promise there will be some uh, more interesting things near the, the second half of the talk. So I'm going to start off very slow, just by uh, going over what I mean by Erdős Conrado results. And this is of course a reference back to the classical result due to Erdős Conrado. So they studied uh, set systems. So you take an N element set, a ground set, and you consider all the D subsets of this N set. Now we're going to take a family in there with the extra requirement that no two should be disjoint, right? So every two should intersect. And if you have n large enough compared to d, you have, you have this one, and this one is kind of necessary because otherwise every two these d subsets intersect. Then you have this bound, right? So this is a an old theorem by now. It's very well known. And since this result appeared, there's been a plethora of related results where you have a similar kind of flavor in different contexts. And so uh, today I will be talking about yet another context which general, generalizes actually some of the, the previously studied ones. So in general, you could say an Erdős Corrado problem consists of two ingredients. You have a finite set of objects because we want to count stuff. So it's always need to have them finite. And then we want to have a notion of being far away. So the far away means uh, in a previous example, being disjoint, right? That's what it means for two subsets to be far away when they're disjoint. And the question in general is uh, the following. What is the largest size we can have of a subset such, such that no two elements are far away, right? So this is like a, the broad idea of this uh, kind of problems that we're studying. So these are a very popular family of problems as well. Uh, there's a tons of strategies to try and prove these. For example, the original uh, theorem has a few, several distinct proofs really, but the one I'm going to focus on is an algebraic approach. And this is one that's been uh, studied very well and also uh, written down very neatly in uh, this book. And I see that the two authors are present here today. So uh, I can personally thank you for this book, I guess. So here we're going to study the algebraic approach to erdős corrado theorem. So we're going to go by uh, some techniques from algebraic graph theory. And there is this very general recipe of how to obtain uh, results in these kinds of problems. So the strategy can be summarized as follows. So first of all, you're going to make a graph theory problem out of it. So you're going to construct a graph on your finite set omega. And you're going to make two objects adjacent if they're far away. Right, so then the set C, which we're looking for, should be a co-click because no two elements should be far away. That means that our set C is a co-click, and hence we're looking for large co-clicks in this graph. That's kind of the, the general setup. And now this is nice because to find large co-clicks in structured graphs, you have plenty of nice uh, results. For example, the one we're going to use is what is called the ratio bound, which is due to uh, Del Sartre or Hoffman or uh, whoever you want to attribute it to. There's a whole uh, history discussion on, uh, on this topic. But it says roughly the following, if you have a regular graph, so all versions same degree, and you consider the adjacency matrix, you can figure out its eigenvalues. Since it's a symmetric real matrix, it has real eigenvalues. And you take the smallest one, this lambda. And then the bound says, the ratio bound gives you an upper bound on the size of copic. So the ratio appears here between the largest and the smallest eigenvalue because k, this one, which is the valency of the graph, is actually also the largest eigenvalue. This is very basic algebraic graph theory. Now, this is a very successful strategy. I mean, there's a whole book about it, I could say, which uh, deals with this uh, idea and also extensions of the idea. And so you could prove the original Erdős Corrado theorem using this recipe. Now you might wonder, well, I mean, sure, if you start from scratch, how do I go about this? I mean, constructing the graph, easy. 
how do I find the eigenvalues? I mean, this one you can compute. That's also not too difficult, but finding the smallest eigenvalue takes a bit more work, right? So a common idea to really get, uh, get something out of this adjacency matrix is to put it into a larger structure. And this is what we're going to call an association scheme. So an association scheme intuitively is just a bigger matrix algebra where you're going to embed this adjacency matrix in which you're interested in. And by using the full force of the full algebra, you're going to deduce the eigenvalues of this single matrix contained in it. That's like the, the rough idea. So just for the people who don't know what an association scheme is, and uh, maybe I'm making a bit of a different definition than you're used to. For me, an association scheme is the following. So we're going to take a finite set omega, which is our finite set we took before. And we're going to consider some 0, 1 matrices uh, whose rows and columns are indexed by omega. So these, these are going to be square matrices. In principle, you could do it over complex numbers. You could also do it over real numbers if uh, your theory allows for it. So there's four restrictions. The first one being that the identity matrix should be among uh, these matrices. And we're just going to put it as the first one for convenience. Second one is that they have to sum up to the all uh, one matrix. So this is again, the all one matrix of size omega by omega. This means that if you interpret these matrices as adjacency matrices of relations, then the relations actually partition all possible relations between the elements of omega. This one says that if you have a matrix in uh, this set, then also its transpose should be in there. Uh, what does this mean? Well, if we consider the relations as being actually graphs, right? So not necessarily undirected, they could be directed. But if you take one of these graphs defined by one of these matrices, you turn around the arrows or you reverse them, then you actually find another adjacency matrix, which should be contained here. That's what this one says. And then finally, this is the real important one. If you multiply two of these matrices, you're actually again contained in the linear span of this thing, right? So if you just take the, the matrix uh, subspace spanned by these things, then actually it should be an algebra. That's what this one says. Now, usually, usually this one will actually be stated a little bit uh, differently. And people will require that actually you have commutativity here, right? So to me, this is not necessary, at least today. So you could say maybe this is the Japanese definition of an association scheme, while uh, other people uh, include this in terms of the association scheme. So maybe those people can call this thing a homogeneous coherent configuration. That's a different terminology for the same thing. We have to be careful when you check the literature to see which definition is being used. Sometimes, depending on the context, we actually even require symmetry, right? So you're not saying it should be somewhere in there. No, it should actually equal itself if you transpose it. So this is a symmetry condition, which means that the association scheme will be an algebra of symmetric matrices. This one will imply commutativity. This is the more standard, I guess you could say, uh, definition. But I'm not going to use that one, right? So for me, association scheme is not necessarily commutative. I really want to stress uh, this fact. OK, so how do these algebras help me if I go back and look at my EKR problem? Well. Uh, I'm going to focus for today on just one particular class of association schemes, which is uh, called a p-polynomial scheme or a distance regular graph. So I'm not going to introduce like a whole theory behind them. I re can refer you to the excellent book I just showed you. But intuitively, you should just know that a distance regular graph or a p-polynomial scheme is an association scheme where these matrices have a natural interpretation. They're just the adjacency matrix of a distance I relation. So if you're set omega, you can put a distance on these things, an actual distance, like a metric. So with all of the, the axioms uh, satisfied. And then the AI is just distance I relation. And sometimes it just so happens that this thing becomes an association scheme. And when this happens, A1, which is the distance one, matrix is actually the distance regular graph. So that's like the, the combinatorial uh, interpretation. 
the algebraical interpretation is that in fact a1 um, this matrix will generate the whole matrix algebra but that's not really important for today it's just to have some idea of these things so i'm going to study three distance regular uh, graphs or three p polynomial association schemes today the first of which is the most classical one the johnson scheme so in this case uh, the vertex set omega or this universe will be all d subsets of an n set so this is really the setting of the original ekr theorem and then distance between two subsets is defined in terms of their intersection right and i'm not writing i here because i want a zero so distance zero to be the identity relation so if i put zero uh Right, so if I put a zero here, you have intersection of size D, that means that the two must be equal, right? And what is the far away relation? The far away relation is the, the disjointness relation. So that means actually the intersection should be zero. So we get D minus D. So the very last one here is the far away. So the last one in the list is the far away relation. That's the Johnson scheme. Now this one's useful because if you have control over this scheme, you can really play around with it and you will come back to some properties that this scheme has this will eventually lead you to the eigenvalues of every single matrix contained in here in particular for this one and if you know the eigenvalues well you can apply the ratio bound and if you can apply the ratio bound you have basically the original ekr theorem right so that's why this one's so interesting i'm going to dig to look at to look at sorry today at another one which is called QNLR, where we replace sets by subspaces and intersection by or sorry size by um, dimension. So the the size of the intersection here is replaced by the dimension of the intersection, and the sets sets are replaced by subspaces of a vector space. So this notation means. Uh, an n-dimensional vector space over a finite field of order q. So q is a prime power for me, right? Same things holds. Uh, a0 is again distance zero relation, so the identity relation. And distance d is the farthest away, so really the disjointness uh, relation. I should say, I mean, non-trivially intersecting is what I mean, right? So these are two of the most popular ones. There's a third one, which I want to discuss today, which is what I guess you could call the dual polar schemes. And this deals with yet another geometry. So I'm not going to go into the geometry of this scheme, but it's again, enough to know that you can define uh, geometries uh, over finite fields, which are called polar spaces. And they have terribly interesting properties, right? They're very fascinating objects. In fact, both this uh, polar space uh, business and the projective spaces were studied because of their relations with groups, with finite simple groups. So that's more or less how they uh, came about in the mathematical world. And to study the finite simple groups is really related to studying these polar spaces. So that was like the original motivation. But I guess in some sense, that also explains why they're why they are beautiful uh, objects, because they have these huge automorphism groups, which are finite simple groups or over groups of them. And it was in this setting that the, the theory of buildings or spherical buildings in my case was developed by Jacques Ditz, who unfortunately passed away end of last year. And it's this kind of spherical building that I'm talking about. So really, I wanted to sound a bit fancy in the title, but what I'm going to talk about today is really results in projective spaces or vector spaces over a finite field and polar spaces, right? That's what you should really think about as being buildings. These things with a little bit of extra structure, but we'll get to that, right? So I told you that um, these association schemes will lead you to nice results, right? For the Johnson scheme, you get the classical EKR and actually for the other two, you also get something interesting. And why, why does everything work? What's really, fundamental to all three of them is that well first of all you see that this thing is a symmetrical relation right so this being at distance i doesn't matter if you take x first or y first it's the same thing also here i mean every single distance relation you put there should be symmetrical just by definition so first of all it's a symmetrical association scheme the thing we're going to get here 
Because it's symmetrical, this actually implies commutativity. So it's both symmetrical and commutative. And so you get, in some sense, the nicest kind of association scheme you can think of, right? And this is not only a nice observation, it's really core because this is what leads to being able to compute the eigenvalues. And it's what I want to stress to my undergraduates, but unfortunately, I don't always seem to succeed, is that this is a very important property that if you have a bunch of diagonalizable matrices, which all commute with each other, then they're simultaneously diagonalizable. And this is amazing. Honestly, if, you, if you've never seen this theorem, maybe, I guess you don't really appreciate it at first, but I mean, I can tell you now by studying all of, all of these properties and problems, I can really appreciate much better than my students do right now. So this is how I call, uh, or rather how I tell to my students. In fact, if you want to, to find this in the book, you won't find it in, in these words. You'll find it in a bit more fancy terms. And you'll say that there's a, a basis of idempotence, right? And it satisfies this equation. So what this says is just that here, there is a, a basis of an eigenspace in the columns. And then you find this eigenvalue for this uh, AI on that eigenspace. That's the same thing, just worded differently, right? And because of this commutativity, you really have a lot of control. It gives you so much power over the algebra, and it leads you to being able to compute these eigenvalues in a, I mean, once you know it in a rather uh, nice way, right? It's again written down very clearly in the book by uh, Chris and Karen. And it just all falls out. There's so much beautiful algebra going on there. It's truly remarkable. So this does not just work for the Johnson scheme, it works for the uh, Grassmann scheme, it works for the dual polar scheme. And this is uh, also something that has been known, but I want to stress that this result was not shown in this way. Also, this result was not shown in this way. So even though the proof works, this was not the original proof. And actually uh, for the polar spaces, it was proven that way. So I'll get to that in just a second. So one thing before I leave this slide is that I want to uh, remark that this bound here and this bound here, both of them are sharp, right? Why are they sharp? Well, you can take a point here, an element of your end set and just take all the subsets through it. Clearly, this thing is intersecting and it clearly has this size, right? So the bound is sharp and these point pencils, what I like to call them, they give you the equality. And you can ask, well, are these the only ones and so on, but I'm not really going to go into that direction today. Same thing here, same kind of bound and actually same kind of construction. So if I just replace or really copy my uh, figure here to here, it would be the same figure only now, this is not a subset anymore, but a subspace, right? But, same thing holds, you take all of the, the, the subspaces to like, let's say ground element or an atom, you could call it. So all spaces through a one dimensional subspace in this sense, right? And again, this gives you equality. So the bound is really sharp. And so going back to the polar spaces, there is this similar result where again, the upper bound is this, oops, point pencil bound, at least in most cases, right? So I want to stress that it's not for all polar spaces. So there's different kinds of polar spaces. There's a few of them and they behave quite differently. And some of them act nice, some of them don't. But in most cases, you find again, this upper bound. So all generators through point roughly. And the proof of this theorem is in fact using the recipe that I showed you earlier, right? So I don't know of any combinatorial proof. I suspect it will be rather hard, but I think this is a very nice uh, result and also a very nice technique. Now, this is already 2011, we're 2022 now. So people have wondered, well, what happens in the other cases, right? Can we, can we say something there? What, what's going on? And so one of the ideas on really how would you like to proceed? I mean, there's these open questions. How are you going to deal with them? One of the ideas is that actually in all three cases that I showed you, there's this kind of lattice structure. So there, there are these atoms, which are uh, single element subsets or one dimensional subspaces or 
uh, isotropic points, and then you have this whole lattice. So this graded lattice, where at some level you have, for example, the D element subsets of a ground set of M elements. And really what the Johnson scheme is doing is just studying this layer, right? It's not using any information at all about the others. It's just focusing on the single layer and this already suffices to give you the proof. Now, you might think, well, okay, this works for the Grassman scheme, this works for the Johnson scheme, but clearly for the polar graphs, it doesn't work. So can we not use the full lattice in some sense? Can we not use this structure maybe to improve the bounds or to find uh, cases of equality? And that was the idea that some people have had in geometry and where there's uh, some results. And this is also the question that actually Klaus uh, Metsch came to uh, Jan in uh, Brussels uh, two years back, I guess, just before we were uh, locked up in our office all day. And that was his question. So he came to with the question, well, I have this very particular polar space. I have this uh, particular rank. Can I use this lattice structure to really get a better bound than the one we have found here before, right? And so how do you, how do you deal with this lattice structure? How do you translate this? Well, the idea is the following. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to talk about the polar space. Actually, I'm going to ignore them completely from now on. I'm going to focus on the vector spaces. Why? Because I think this has the more uh, didactical approach. I think you'll learn more than if I were to do everything at once. Right. So I'll, I'm going to try and teach you what we have found, how we can deal with this whole lattice structure just by focusing on one single example. And I think this really contains all the germs for channelization in whatever direction you want. And you will be able to have a better grasp of the paper. Because for me personally, when I heard about this problem, I was very excited because this is a problem I was interested in. So I asked my advisor, Jan, he said, well, were you working on with Klaus? He told me about the problem. And I said, hmm, surely this is something that I should be able to I mean, contribute to, right? And so they were stuck and did some very ugly computations. And it turned out that there's some uh, little known paper due to Andries Brouwer, which actually gives you the methods to really perform the recipe, to carry out the full recipe and find the eigenvalues of these uh, graphs that you're going to be interested in by taking the whole lattice structure into account. Now, I have to tell you that in order to understand all the concepts that he used, it took me, I think, two months or three months just to dig through all of the theories. So there's spherical buildings involved, there's group theory involved, there's representation theory of algebras involved, there's character theory involved. There's so many topics that I had to study. And I don't want to overload you today with all this information, right? So I'm just going to give you like a little flavor of how you can proceed and how you can really deal with the structure. And I hope that maybe you'll have the enthusiasm to actually read the paper, which we've tried to make as accessible as possible to non-experts. So that's the, the marketing pitch of today. So for now, just vector spaces, plain old vector spaces, you're surely well acquainted with them. Right, so the full lattice structure will be translated into the notion of flags, right? So you're going to look at flags, which are just a set of subspaces, all of which one is contained in the next one, right? So you have this whole chain in the lattice, really. And we're going to focus at first at maximal chains. So really, you start with a one-dimensional subspace, two, three, four, five. They're all contained in there up until the maximal one, right? So those are the things we're interested in. And I can just tease you by saying that the maximal chains in this lattice is actually what the spherical building stuff is all about, right? This is like their core business. But this took me a long time before I figured that out as well and what it really means. So let's think about how we can deal with these things. So we're going to look at flags in vector spaces, right? And we're going to try and figure out an EKR theorem here and see how this generalizes what we've seen and also how this could be useful or how uh, we could use this also for the polar space case. Right, so as I promised you, very specific case, four-dimensional vector space, we're going to look at two-dimensional subspaces. And the theorem here uh, specifies to this one, the size of a co-clique is at most Q squared plus Q plus one. 
Now, um, what I'm going to do for vector spaces is I'm going to make pictures because pictures are nice and you'll understand better if I make pictures, but I'm not going to make pictures in the four dimensional vector space. I'm actually going to do it in the three dimensional projective space. Now there's of course a whole uh, theory that is well known uh, how the connection between these two are, but for sake of pictures, all you need to know is the following. So you have your vector space, your origin somewhere here. If you take a one dimensional subspace, you're going to project it, right? That's the projective geometry idea onto a hyperplane, which is not containing the origin. So projecting or just intersecting, it's really the same thing. So what you'll get is just one point of intersection, right? So one dimensional thing goes to a point in my pictures. And a two-dimensional subspace, well, if I draw it here, this is a two-dimensional subspace. This will intersect in a line, right? So 2D things will go to a line. Similarly, you have 3D stuff, which will go to a plane, right? So if I draw this thing, this is a maximal flag consisting of a point, a line, and a plane. This really corresponds to one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional subspaces, right? But this thing is just nicer to draw, so I'm going to focus on these kinds of pictures. Okay, so what does the theorem say here then? It says it's at most q squared plus q plus one. Well, this turns out to be a point pencil, and you can really draw it in the following way. You take a one-dimensional subspace, which is a point, and then all the two-dimensional subspaces through this thing. So these are all lines through this point, right? This is equality. You can show, in fact, that if you have equality, it's either this thing or you take everything in a plane. So everything in a three-dimensional subspace. But that's just a, a side remark. Now, we're going to go from subspaces to flags. So the first question is, how large can a set of mm, flags be? Well, what, what's the, the far away, right? How do you define far away? Because that's the second element we need for our question. So our, our universe will be the maximal flags. But what is far away? Well, if I take a flag in this way, what is the furthest away you could go with another flag? Well, let's go step by step. The furthest way I can take a point away from this one is just by taking outside everywhere, right? So take the point outside of the plane. Then I'm going to construct a line, which should be a line here, 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 somewhere. Well, for sure, I know that it's going to intersect this plane by Grassman's identity in a point. So let's make it so that the point of intersection is actually not on this line, right? So let me draw it this way, right? So the two lines are actually disjoint is what I'm drawing. And then finally, I want to draw the plane. So this will be a plane in this way. So it will be a plane which contains this point of intersection. So in this plane, I will see a line of intersection. So I'm going to make it so that this line does not contain this point, right? That's the farthest away I can go by, again, Grassmann's identity. You can just check that all of the intersections are forced. So to check this again, we have the blue flag, we have the orange flag, and being far away means that the point, the blue point is not in the orange plane, that the blue line is disjoint with the orange line, and that the blue plane does not contain the orange point. That is what we will call far away, and that's what called opposition. So two maximal flags are opposite to each other in four-dimensional vector space if they're in this situation, right? And that's what we're going to focus on. This will be our far away notion. So this is going to be the question, how large can a set of non-opposite flags be in four-dimensional subspace? Well, we managed to answer this. I mean, as a very special case of our more general theorem, that it can have size at most this. 
And so uh, I can tell you that it's sharp. So why is it sharp? Let me retake the example from above, which is just all lines through a point. What you're going to do is you're going to blow up every line to a maximal flag. So you're going to extend this line to a maximal flag in every possible way. So you're going to pick a point and you're going to pick a, a plane through it, right? And this will give you this blow up factor of Q plus one square because Q plus one choices for the point, Q plus one choices for the plane gives you this factor. And so indeed you have sharpness again, right? And you have this, these point pencils, you could call them being examples. So that's the theorem. The main question is of course, how do you prove this, right? And the answer is again, using the ratio bound, again, using the recipe, but I mean, where do you start? How do you find the eigenvalues of these kinds of graphs? That's the main question right now. And so what we would like to find is an association scheme where we can embed this uh, far awayness graph, this oppos opposition graph or oppositeness graph. We can embed this adjacency matrix and then we can study the whole algebra. But I mean, there's no like obvious algebra, at least I would say, at least to me, it's not obvious where you would find this. And um, I'm going to spoil you, spoil you already a little bit. Um, and I'm going to say that actually you need 24 relations. So if you try by hand to figure out all of the possible relations between two flags, you'll need a lot of paper because that's 24 possibilities that you need to take into account. Second, if I have a flag, I can make a second flag in this way, for example, putting its point here, uh, its line outside, and then the plane also outside. This is a non-symmetrical relation, right? Because the orange point is on the blue line, but the blue point is not on the orange line. So for sure, if this were an association scheme, it's not going to be symmetric. Right, so this already makes life more difficult as well. So how do you go about this thing? How do you describe it in a way such that you can actually deal with it? Because 24 relations doing it by hand is just insanity. Well, there's one key fact that is uh, geometrically uh, doable to prove, but it actually underlies the building theory as well. So I'm not going to call into existence all of the, the details of building theory, but this is really uh, an essential feature of these geometries. So if I take any two flags in any relation, in any possible relation, I can find the basis of my vector space such that the point line plane full space is described in the, this way for the first one. And you just have a permutation for the second one using the same four vectors. So what this means is that actually every permutation of four elements will give you a flag F dash, right? And so permutations of four elements, while well, you're thinking of the symmetric group of four elements, hey, that group has actually 24 elements. And indeed, it turns out that every relation is uniquely identified by an element in the symmetric group. So that's already nice. You have like this natural indexing set, which gives you a proper geometrical relation. So let me just give you one example. A, one, two. So I'm writing my permutations in cycle notation. So this is the, the permutation that maps one to two and two to one. So if you have E1, E2, E3, E4, which I'm just going to write down as one, two, three, four, what one, two does is it switches the elements in positions two and one, not one and two rather, and you get this permutation. So if the first one is the blue flag, that means that this line is the span of E1. E2, the span of E2 will be here somewhere. Span of E3 will be here. Span of E4 will be this. Then actually these two should be switched, right? That's what this thing says. So my second flag will actually be this, the one where the point is lying here. Same line and same plane, right? So geometrically, what does this thing correspond to? It corresponds to the relation change the point.
and leave everything else untouched, right? So that's how you have this geometrical interpretation of the elements in the symmetric group using this small, I mean, computation using this geometrical fact really from one slide before. And now you have all of these matrices. You want to figure out, I mean, sure, you can add them, you can subtract them, but is it really an association scheme? Are these 24 elements, these matrices, closed under multiplication? Because that's what we really want to see. And in order to see this, because this is the really key fact, we need to have more information about this group, about the symmetric group. So I present to you the symmetric group in the shortest possible form that I know of, which is by it's uh, called thinking diagram. So how should you read this? Well, every dot corresponds to a generator, S1, S2, S3, all of which are involutions. So every single one of these three is one if you square them. And then you have the following relations, S1, S2, Cubed is the same as S2, S3. Cubed is the same as the identity. And then S1, S3 squared is also the identity, right? So this is a presentation of the symmetric group um, for uh, letters. So it's generated by three elements. And you might think, well, really? I mean, yes, really, I'll show you. If you just plug in these involutions, you'll see that's true, right? So this is really a more explicit form of the presentation of the symmetric group. Now, how do I remember this? Well, first of all, I always have to have involutions as the dots. So this one is obvious. And then where does this three come from? Well, the three is actually the number of edges between two dots plus two. So I have one edge, I do plus two, I get three. One edge plus two, I have three. I have zero edges between S1 and S3 plus two gives me this two, right? So this is a very concise notation for the, the symmetric group. And I just want to give you again a little bit of the flavor of how all of these things are connected. You can actually also see the geometry here because if you, you can make a perfectly well-defined diagram if you label by points, lines, and planes in the four dimensional subspace. So this is 1D, 2D, 3D spaces. And this again has an actual interpretation in terms of buildings, but I'm not going to go in there. It's super nice in my opinion that you have this exact two diagrams and there really is strong correspondence to them. This took me like, again, two months of studying before I really got the aha earliness to really figure this thing out. But once you know it, it's just amazing. Right, so we have this group. And there's one more thing we need, which is a longest word. So a longest word, I mean, what's that? Well, if you have these three generators, which I will again denote by S1, S2, S3, there's a length function. So from my symmetric group to the natural numbers, which just maps the length of every element of the symmetric group written as a word in these three generators. So if you have, for example, S1, S2, S3, this one has length three. On the other hand, if you write S1, 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 one rather, don't forget that this is actually just the identity. So this is length zero, right? Not length two. But even if you use all of the relations uh, that I just showed you before, and you use uh, these cancellation things, which I've shown you here, then you can show that the length function is actually well-defined, right? So there's several uh, words to describe a single element sometimes, but the length will always be the same. That's the main takeaway. And moreover, for this group, there's only one word, which is the longest one, and it's this one. You cannot make any longer word uh, using just these three generators. This is called W not often. So just to be um, very specific, if you write it in cycle notation, this will be the permutation that swaps uh, sorry, not one and three, one and four and two and three. So the reversal uh, rather, that's the longest word. Now this one will be important to us as you'll just see in a few moments. So you can already think of why this will be interesting because in some sense, the longest word is the farthest away 
from being identity in terms of length, right? So you can already see where I'm going with this. And um, what I also want to add is that I want, um, what, did I, what did I want to add? Right, this thing, um, you can check that it's symmetrical as well, right? Or rather uh, symmetrical, what do I mean? It's an involution. And you'll just see why I slipped there and called it symmetrical in just a minute. So the main theorem here in this business is that we now have this description of the symmetric group. We have this relation between the symmetric group and the relations in my geometrical object, which are the flags of my vector space. And there's really an algebra there. It is an association scheme. This is what been uh, proven by Iwahori and Matsumoto. And if you're trying to look for these things, this is also something that took me a few uh, months, is that these things are called Iwahori Heka algebras, right? So if you want to study these algebra, people have studied these things immensely during the last, I guess, 70, 60, 70 years or something, but under a completely different name. And so if I wanted to look for association scheme in those texts, there is no references coming up. It's called Iwahori Heka algebras. And the multiplication really works and it's described in this way. So if you want to multiply AS, so S will be one of these involutions I showed you, and W is just any word in the, the generators, then you can multiply them and it will depend on whether the length goes up if I multiply W by S or if it goes down. You can show that it can't be the same. It has to go up or down. Either it's this thing, so if the length goes up, you just put S uh, with the W, and if it goes down, you actually have this thing. And you can show iteratively, I mean, you can see really, because every W is made up out of several involutions, S, that this really shows you the multiplication rules of the algebra, and we really get an association, association scheme. Now it's not going to be symmetrical as I showed you. And moreover, you can actually see already here that it's not going to be commutative as well because uh, A12 times A23, this will be, uh, I hope I'm doing this right, A1123. And then this one should be the other one. Right, maybe I reversed them, but anyway, the multiplication will not be commutative because on the one hand you get uh, the cycle clockwise and the other one is a counterclockwise triangle uh, cycle in some sense, right? So it's not symmetric, it's not commutative. So it is really quite tricky to get a grasp of this stuff. So the main point is that this W naught that I showed you just earlier, this one really indexes the opposition. So A W naught is the adjacency matrix of opposition. And because W naught is an involution, you have a symmetrical relation, which is what we saw before in a geometrical way, right? So again, you have this relation between the group and the, uh, the geometry, and they really play along very nicely. So let me just sketch you um, why this thing is really, I mean, this algebraical theorem is really something geometrical as well. So I'll show you why this multiplication is in fact true. So remember this one, we've seen it before. This one has changed the point, right? So let's see what this one looks like, A123. So A123, it maps 1, 2, 3, 4, 2, 2, 3, 1, 4. So I have the blue flag at first, which is the top one. So again, this means that this is the span of A1, the span of E2 is somewhere here, span of E3 is somewhere here, span of E4 is somewhere here. So my point of my second flag will be this one. My line of my second flag will be this one. The plane will be the same, and this one will again be outside, right? Because that's the order here. So you have again, one, two, three, four. Now I'm taking two, three, one, four. So this will be point line plane. So just to draw it, this will be my second flag. So you change the point first and then you change the line. Very well. 
so how do you do computations of these kind of uh, type? Well, if you've worked with association schemes, you'll know that you have to do the following. So I'm starting off with a flag, the maximum flag. First, I have to go through this one. So I have to change the point. I'm going to do it in red. And then I have to perform this relation. I have to check what happens if I change the point, change the line. So I'm here. So I'm going to change the point, change the line. I get this. Or I could go back to the original one, this one, right? So there's two options there. So I'm going to copy this drawing. So either I'm changing point to another one, yet another one, I'm taking this line, or I change to the same one again, and I change the line, right? These are my two options. Uh, this is not a very good flag. My line should be here, and you get this one. So these are the possible relations. This one is actually, uh, you can, or rather this one is A to three. You can check this, it's not too hard. And this one is again, the change point, change line relation. So this is A one, two, three. Now, how do you get the coefficients Q and Q minus one? Well, what you have to do is you have to count how many ways were there to choose the red flag so the red point essentially, to go from blue to red to orange. Well, uh, red is a point on this line, which is not the blue one, not the orange one. So I have Q minus one choices. And here I have the red point, which is not the orange, not the blue one, but they're the same. So I have one option more. So I have Q uh, choices because this is a geometrical fact. There's Q plus one points on the line. There's Q plus one one-dimensional spaces in a two-dimensional space, right? So the multiplication works both algebraically and it really makes sense geometrically. Now, the only thing you have to do now, once you realize that there's actually a nice association scheme is you need to figure out its eigenvalues, right? So I'm going to go um, a bit faster through this part, but the main thing to take away is that we went from commutative association schemes to non-commutative. So instead of diagonalizability of everything, you have to block diagonalize everything, right? This is an algebra property. So instead of having um, this matrix, which we were interested in, which was A, W naught, we wanted to know its eigenvalues. Instead, we can go to the blocks, right? We can block diagonalize it and look at the eigenvalues of each of the blocks, which is already an improvement, but it's not really enough because how do you control the blocks? Well, there's another property, which is really the main one, and which you can find, for example, in this book, which is the book I've uh, studied for a few months, as I told you, a book by Gek and Pfeiffer. And this really contains the following theorem and all of the theory that you need uh, before it, the theorem due to Springer, which says the following, and I'll translate it for you. If you have, not this one, but the adjacency matrix of a position, you square it, it will be central, right? So it commutes with everything. What does that mean? If you look at the block diagonalizability by Schur's lemma, essentially, it says that every block will be a diagonal matrix. And this is really the key, right? So you get blocks, 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 blocks. Everywhere, this one will be diagonal. And the diagonal elements are this thing. Now, again, don't really bother with uh, these things. What it says is that the diagonal elements will be Q to a certain exponent, and the exponent is computed here. This is the number of transpositions, so cycles of length two. These are characters on S, which is an element of the symmetric group. So this is really a character of the symmetric group, right? So you forget about the big algebra, you're really interested in characters of the symmetric group. And this is just terrific. So you have this huge algebra depending on Q, depending on your field, but really the computations boil down to computing character uh, values of the symmetric group, which is just fixed. So I'm not going to show you how you do it. So I'll skip this real quick, but you can show that in our case, you have Q to the six and minus Q to the four. Why is this? Well, you have the, uh, you have the eigenvalues of the square. So you can go to the original one by just taking the root. All you need to know is where it's plus and minus, 
this can be done. And you find this as the largest and this is the smallest eigenvalue. So you plug it in the ratio bound and voila, out comes the result, which is just, uh, I was very proud of this when it all boiled uh, down to this computation. So in summary, which, uh, which is what I will finish with, is that we can do this thing for all flags in projective and polar spaces. So this is the spherical building business I told you about. We can also do partial flags in polar spaces. Partial flags in projective spaces is a bit trickier. We have to do some more work to see what's going on there. But this means that if we can figure out the eigenvalues, one application, which was our main motivation to start, is to find EKR results. And we can really find the EKR results which we wanted. So there's just three more uh, remarks that I want to make. First one is that uh, our original motivation to improve bounds for polar spaces, which were still open, has uh, failed, which was in the end, I guess, not too surprising because what we find is more or less blow-ups of bounds. So you can really see how the small ones relate to the maximal flags and the maximal flags relate to the original result. So that's a shame, but at least the theory is nice. Second of all, um, these algorithms to compute the eigenvalues, they're independent of Q, right? This is what I wanted to show you. So if you fix, let's say, the dimension of your vector space, you can really just give it to a computer and it'll spit out all of the eigenvalues for any Q, whatever you want, because you're just needing the exponents, which is quite nice. And third of all, I think this is, uh, to me at least, the most interesting thing, is that at least as far as I'm aware, but I hope that maybe someone can correct me here, that as far as I know, these are the only EKR bounds which have been found using this recipe in non-commutative association schemes. And what really saves everything is this uh, result due to Springer, this centrality of the element that just the adjacency matrix, or rather it's square, commutes with everything is enough, right? And this really gives you the full uh, theorem. So I hope that maybe someone else knows a different reference where they also managed to do that. But as far as I know, this is the only one. I think that's quite nice. So that's all I wanted to say. So thank you very much. And I hope you learned something today. Now is any question for them? Uh, is there any extension to, uh, uh, can you hear? Uh, is there any extension to kind of uh, uh, extension of hypergraph, hyper, uh, extension of uh, graphs, like hypergraph, super hypergraph, uh, or super graph, weighted graph, something like that. Especially, I mean, hypergraph, is there any extension direction to that, to do that the same way? Mm. So the question is whether there's an extension for hypergraphs, right? Um, yes. Well, then I guess, first of all, you should figure out what the, the correct notion of being far away is, because for now we just define far away between two elements. So if you want to have hypergraphs and hyper edges, for example, for a three uniform hypergraph, you would need to figure out what far away means for three objects at a time. I don't know of any such, uh, any such results or such notions, let's say. So maybe depending on the context, maybe, but I don't know of any, any extension at least. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll ask something. Um, so are there other relation matrices in this scheme other than the one for the long word that, that give you this nice property? I didn't quite get the question. I think my sound is a. Uh... It could be me too. I don't know if this is any better. Uh, can you hear me? No. Sorry, Tina. Could you repeat the question because it's really silent for me. The, I think I have some issue with the sounds. So I have to fix yet. Uh, Max, what's your question again? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me, Tina? Or... Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So my question is. If there is, if other than the matrix for the long word in this association scheme, if there are other matrices uh, or, or other classes that uh, give you a nice setup, you know, you get something symmetric, you can apply this the Springer result, and learn something interesting. Obviously, it, it wouldn't be for the the same notion of 
far away, but I'm just wondering if there's other nice combinatorics in there. So I might have heard, I think the question is whether there's other relations next to the, the AW not where you can apply this, this, this yeah. theory, right? That's a question? Yes, yeah. Right, so uh, not directly because I don't know of any other uh, relations which have this centrality property. So figuring out the eigenvalues is a bit trickier. Um, you could do it, let's say, for fixed rank anyway, because um, how do I put this? If you have fixed rank, you can just plug it into a computer and you can start figuring out what happens. But in general, let's say you let the, the dimension of the projective space vary or you let the rank of your polar space vary. It's, it's not so easy. So we've tried playing with that, but it's not clear if you can really say something profound and interesting.